Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I, I, my new thing is I discovered this quote a few weeks ago, and I can't stop thinking about it. So I'm sharing it again, like last week, um, that I think really captures, I know for, for a, a few of you, this is your first Brain Club. And I think this captures like what we, what we, what we try to do here. Um, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think what we try to do here at Brain Club um, is to provide education about neurodiversity first and foremost, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's about bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's possible and to contribute to systems change by shifting social norms, developing shared vocabulary, um, shared concepts, and uh, seeing these concepts play out through the stories the stories of community panelists like those we'll hear from today, um, the stories of so many people in our community. This is a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn and feel safe and experience for many people, something that's different from the quote outside world um, and, and really promoting new ways of thinking and being. Um, we believe that's how you collectively change the world. We do wanna say before we begin, uh, this is an education program um, only, this is not for medical or mental health advice. This is not a support group. Auburn's blog does have programs that do all those things, but this is for education purposes only. So it's not a place to discuss or solve individual specific problems or process individual circumstances. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club and uh, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to sit still or you know, look at the camera or any other neuronormative construct. Feel free to fidget or stim or eat or take breaks or whatever else needs doing. Um, you're welcome to communicate in any format that you are most comfortable with. You can also send um, private chat messages uh, to a member, any members of our staff. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, uh, we, uh, we really strive to uh, protect the collective access needs, you know, the access needs of the group. Um, giving space um, and making sure to um, li limit what we talk about to uh, the impact of experiences, not distressing events. Last bit of access um, uh, uh, commentary. Um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see live transcript closed captioning, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And you can also do the same for hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat box so that I will actually see what you're all saying. Hi, everybody. Um, speaking of the chat box, we got feedback a couple of weeks ago that some folks' versions of Zoom, or depending on what device somebody's on, if we're using the thread feature, we're like replying in thread, some people can't see that. So we're, we're asked, we're, we're trying this experiment. We were asking folks to type in the regular chat box um, instead of the, the reply thread so that everyone can access um, the content. All right, so um, our topic for today, connection is the path to health. It's actually the topic for the month. Um, what we know is that lacking strong social connection is really bad for health. It has the equivalent harmful impact on health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. We know that um, the overwhelming majority of neurodivergent adults struggle with loneliness. And when we think about all of the different ways in which community members are othered, when we think about the impact of intersectional marginalization, the loneliness just stacks and stacks. Um, and, and to quote from um, Dr. Rebecca Murphy, um, who's the author of the book Together, which we'll be discussing at this month's book chat, the last week of the month, social connection stands out as a largely unrecognized and underappreciated force for addressing many of the critical problems we're dealing with, both as individuals and as a society. And so, you know, as we say here at Albertans Belong, to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we must do everything. And so, you know, social connection, bringing people together based on shared interests and a shared vision of what's possible, that is so, so for us, so critical to health, which is why this is our theme of the month. And so we'll be talking. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about this theme in several different ways throughout the month. But today, um, we'll begin by hearing from leaders in our community. Um, asynchronously, we'll be joined by Keegan Alba, for the executive director of Dad Guild. 
Sheila Linton, the executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. And live, we'll be joined by Luke Rackers, the director of development and communications for Central Vermont Council on Aging, and Chris Hansen, the executive director of intentional peer support. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so what we'll do is um, we'll hear from our pre-recorded panelists to start. So um, let me turn off my share screen and David, take it away. And while the video is playing, feel free to, you can ask questions in, in the chat. Those panelists are not here, but if we can't answer the questions, we'll, we'll pass the questions back to our panelists and circle back next week with responses. But feel free to use the chat while you're watching the video. Would, would, would love to hear about Death Guild. Yeah, sure. So my name is Keegan Alba. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the executive director at Dad Guild. And we are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2019, uh, working to engage dads and masculine identifying caregivers in their roles as parents and nurturers. Uh, and we do this through providing like a, a wide range of avenues into our community. Um, so we do play groups for like dads and kids. We do whole family events. We do dad's night out events where people will go and like, you know, do trivia or go play basketball or pickleball. Uh, we'll do monthly campfires outside for people to like share how they're feeling. Uh, we knew we do a new dad cohort. So like a group when you have a, a, a baby and you need a community to, you know, experience that with, we have that. Uh, workshops, book groups, podcasts, <clears throat> Facebook group. Uh, we have a couple, we do a couple, three virtual events uh, every night, uh, every month as well. Um, so like two Zoom check-ins and a game night. Um, so, you know, our, our philosophy or one of our many philosophies is that there isn't the one solution to meet everyone's needs that uh, people have a, a variety, uh, have a wide range of needs and what they feel comfortable with and what their preferences are and also just where they're physically able to show up and not show up. And so trying to provide as many avenues into our community so that it doesn't require, uh, you know, things like geographic location or financial status or uh, what your immune system uh, looks like, mm -hmm. that those are not barriers to participation. Um, and, you know, we have a firm belief that when we engage men uh, and male identifying folks as nurturers and we promote a version of masculinity that's rooted in love and empathy and vulnerability, that our kids are better off, uh, there's so much research that developmentally kids do better when dads are engaged and supported dads themselves experience huge benefits uh i could go for a while around how men are struggling right now mental health wise loneliness uh uh suicide uh you know the rate of suicide for men is four times that of women uh here in the state of vermont and nationally so it supports men's uh mental health and then also advancing issues of gender equality, preventing violence, and dismantling systems of oppression. Uh, I think that by, you know, historically men in our society have a lot of power. And so one, how are we supporting them and engaging them as caregivers? And then two, how are we, how are we, uh, I guess like leveling the playing field a bit? Like um, there's a lot of research that the, the amount of money that women leave on the table because they step away from their jobs to care for a child once they're born um, is pretty astronomical. Uh, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime if they take five years off after the birth of a child. Never, I've never had a conversation like this with the idea of like, you're, you're really, you're really from a, a social justice perspective, you're not in addition to engaging and supporting a, a a group of people at the exact same time you are facilitating the redistribution of power away from the people you're serving that is fucking mind blowing to me um so tell me more about that uh it's it's been a fine dance to walk I mean, at first we were like Ooh, we don't want to scare people away because the idea of even just men getting together and talking was like such a foreign concept that we didn't want to scare people away. But now that we've grown, we have like 
you know, we have uh, two, we have four staff. Uh, we have a network of about a thousand dads across the state. We've provided, I think, like 800 hours of community-based programming over the past five years. Um, we're a growing network that has it's just had a significant impact that we just, as we're collecting data, we're seeing the impact that we are having on our communities and our families. And um, now we can definitely, I feel like we can speak a bit more confidently about like, hey, part of our goal here is to dismantle systems of power and redistribute that power. Like, I don't want to use the phrase smash the patriarchy because even that phrase in itself is violent. And I think, <laughs> I think that like, I don't know, hug, hug out the patriarchy or like, I, I don't know what the phrase is, but, but that is what we're invested in doing. Part, part for me, like part of reimagining inclusive community, if, if, if anyone does not have, you know, freedom to access the resources that they need and in, in a, you know, dignified, respected way, um, you know, like no one wins. Yeah, no one wins and everyone suffers in a patriarchy and being able to have that shared understanding and look at how are we all perpetuating this and what can we do about it? And the idea that there's something about the mech, like, like the, the different mechanisms by which people might go about reimagining systems in a more equitable fashion. What I'm hearing from you is the idea that community connection and the, for all of those reasons, so it's, it's, it's not just, you know, a provision of resources. It's the idea of community and the, the health the um you know the co-regulation that like the, 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 there's there the skills right there's like so the, you're addressing many mechanisms of that redistribution of power be, like in a way that if you skip the community aspect it's not like go to a training and you'll learn the thing to dismantle the patriarchy it's it, you're doing something far bigger than that we're not we're not we're not experts we're not coming here being like hey this is how you parent it's like, no, the idea is like, talk to everyone, like get informed. Let's, yeah, let's read books. Let's do workshops. And then let's discuss, like knowing that it's one solution doesn't work for everyone, but building community and like having conversations about it and learning from each other uh, is just such a powerful experience. Absolutely. So how can folks get involved with Dad Guild? Yeah, so folks can get involved with Dad Guild. You can go to our website, dadguild.org, um, and we're on Facebook and uh, Instagram. So if you just search for Dad Guild, one thing I will stress, because sometimes folks are like, oh, it's just for dads. Um, that's not the case. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll look at our website, we try to color coordinate our calendar. We have like a winter programming guide up that says like what's, what's for whole families, what's just for dads, because we also like, we want to be a part of this re-envisioning what uh, like healthy parenting looks like in building community where it's, we're not putting down people, we're being vulnerable, we're being honest, we're, we're, we're connecting with each other. And so we try to be as inclusive as possible while also not like taking too far away from our mission. But what that looks like is, you know, having these whole family events, uh, we've done, we're taking a break for the winter, but we do a play group for uh, uh, transgender and gender non-conforming caregivers. Um, and then this winter, there's a couple opportunities for families with uh, neurodivergent children um, who, uh, uh, there's some bowling events where there's a private bowling alley that we have rented out. So if attending like spare time bowling or this overstimulating, if that's too much uh, for a family that here's an opportunity to, uh, you know, go bowling with a family in a very low stimuli environment. Um, so I just encourage folks, even if you're not a dad, just like check out and see what we're all about. and. Uh, you know, we're, we're not just an organization, we're a movement, and I'm not just the director, I am also a client. Uh, um, my name is Sheila Linton, I use she, her pronouns. I am the co-founder and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center, and I identify as a Black Indigenous femme um, that is born and raised in Vermont and currently living in Southern Vermont. And um, a little bit story about the root. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what the root is, and then I'll tell you maybe a little bit background about how the root was created. So the root is a Vermont based nonprofit um, BIPOC, which is black indigenous people of color led organization 
centering blackness. Uh, we prioritize BIPOC people and their communities by shifting resources to BIPOC communities for leadership, connection, healing, education, and the arts, and support BIPOC led racial justice work. Um, just so people know, a lot of times people ask me about what does centering blackness mean? And so we like to define that how we do for ourselves. Um, for us, um, a piece of centering blackness is um, and why we use that term is because we in this society live in an anti black society, where in this country, black folks are really put at the bottom. And so we recognize that colonization of our country has meant that um, there are practices and ways that do not benefit us and systems that do not benefit us. So when we talk about centering blackness, it really mean, it means honoring all types of black people, but it also ultimately means celebrating us and honoring us and creating policies and practices that intentionally lift up and protect black people. And it also means celebrating and having joy of our art and 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 eradicating or taking away um, that white supremacy culture that um, we've been born into in our society. And um, when we talk about centering blackness, it's not only centering black people, but it's centering people of color. And through that, when we lift up the bottom, everyone gets lifted up. So we, we, we make that distinction because some people question why black, why centering, why this, why that. And when we hope that people will take away is that by doing this, we are really lifting up not only black people, but other BIPOC people and other people who have been marginalized in their lives. So um, the root, um, we are happy to be celebrating our 10 year this year. And we were um, co-founded by four individuals, one of those people being myself, another person being Mel Motel, um, Alex Fisher, and Angela Burkfield. And all of us were sort of, not sort of, all of us are or were racial justice, um, social justice um, advocates, community organizers, academic people, people who were in that realm. And we wanted to provide a space in the community where people could have a physical space that was safer to come together, to mobilize, to organize, to connect, to build relationships, and to really work on the issues that they wanted to work on. So we sat around Fisher, Alex Fisher's table, and we br brainstormed these visions and ideas. And we came up with like, yeah, let's create a center. And so we found an accessible, affordable place in the downtown Brattleboro area. And then we decided to open that up as a community center for us to have a shared working office space for our own individual social racial justice endeavors. And then to open it up to the community for um, that mobilizing, that organizing and that community connection. Can you share a bit about what your vision for inclusive community looks like? Our vision is really, <clears throat> it's simple and complex at the same time, right? There's always a yes and over here at the root. And so what it really boils down to is Vermont BIPOC communities have the resources we need to thrive. And how we do that, what is really important to us and why I'm really happy that we're having this conversation is because within our BIPOC community, some of the intersectionalities of our BIPOC community that we do um, focus, emphasize on is youth, is people who are differently abled. And that could mean whether physically or brain-wise or however it might be and queer and trans folks as well. So those are really, when we are really planning events and where we're really connecting and really collaborating, those are the other intersectionalities among others, but those are always at the center of the work that we do because we really understand that youth have been really um, adultized, <laughs> if that's a word, and have been left behind and have been shut down and have been silenced and they're the next generation to hopefully carry on the work that we all are doing. We realize that queer and trans folks are clearly still under attack and um, and and need um, safer spaces to also be in. And we realize that all people show up differently and that we want to be able to be not only accommodating but as inclusive as possible. Some of the ways that we do that 
is by creating opportunities for belonging, affinity spaces for BIPOC people within their intersectionalities. We um, are hosting programming and events in our physical space that bring BIPOC together for the purpose of healing, development, developing collective leadership skills and building social power. You know, there's all different types of power and we really believe in social power, which is relationship building. There is nothing better than having the relationships that you need to carry out the work that you need and to make the systemic change that is needed for our communities. Are there programs that you'd like to share with our community? I would love to share our programs with you. So yes, we have six different programs. Soul Food Sunday is an affinity, a BIPOC affinity space. We do occasionally have mixers. And when we say mixers, that means that people can invite their, um, their white partners or allies or community people that are safe enough to be in the space. We also have a program that is Youth for Change. And Youth for Change is a youth-led program based in anti-racist principles working to dismantle white supremacy culture and other harmful structures and systems to shift power. What's important about Youth for Change is one, it's a multiracial program. It is from 12 to 22. And the reason why it's 12 to 22 is because it's inclusive of adults with disabilities or different abilities. And we understand that when you turn 18, that it is not real, that you're an adult and magically, like whatever, you get cut off from all these things and it just is not realistic. So we wanted to make sure we intentionally were making space and prioritizing those populations for inclusivity. Just a little shout out, we will be having on February 23rd, 14 to 18 year olds and those who are connected to the Youth for Change program will be having a dance. And um, that dance, we did have it before, and it was so great to see those populations, meaning BIPOC, queer, trans, and differently abled youth, primarily in that space. It was beautiful because a lot of times you think of those youth and they're the ones who don't want to show up to the dance because it's social anxiety. They're, they're bullied, they're ostracized, the crowd isn't for them. Like there's so many reasons why many of these people wouldn't even show up to maybe a school dance or maybe they show up to a school dance, but they're not really comfortable there. This provides a space for them where they can be their um, more fuller authentic selves. Um, we also have the I Am Vermont 2 program, which is a um, photo story project for BIPOC people to tell our own stories and convey that racial microaggressions have a significant impact in our lives. So a racial microaggression um, could look like, I'll say what mine is. Mine is, um, um, you know, where are you from? Um, I identify as a black indigenous person. I'm born and raised in Vermont. And so people often will ask me where I'm from, but in the context of what they're asking me, it's typically white people in disbelief that there are pe black people in Vermont. And then in disbelief that there are actually black people born in Vermont. And then, and then disbelief of like, no, but really, where are you from? No, I'm really from Vermont. <laughs> like, and so it's a racial microaggression because there's this assumption that I'm a person of color that we are not from here, don't belong here, and we're invisibilized. And so there are, there's a bazillion racial microaggressions that people of color experience on a daily basis. There are other microaggressions that aren't racial that I'm sure the people that you work with experience on a daily basis. And so we are challenging those racial microaggressions in the statewide project that's an art project where we're taking photos of BIPOC people from all around the state in those photos, they have a whiteboard that talks that says what their racial microaggression is, or it says what they've how they responded or how they feel about it. And then those photos are framed and then they're created into an exposition. And we have been curated in the Vermont State House numerous times. We will be back there next February. We've been in museums, we've been in schools, we've been in galleries, we've been in restaurants, we've been in community um, community um, centers. We've been all over the place. And it's also been turned into a um, TV show through um, the YouTube. You can find it at I Am Vermont 2 YouTube to where then our coordinator, Sha'an, takes um, those people that we took a picture of and actually interviews them in a half an hour interview. And then you get to know a little bit more about who the person is 
besides that micro ra racial microaggression and get to learn a little bit more about your BIPOC communities throughout the state. So this program includes the arts and includes um, it includes um, making white folks aware of the harm that they're creating for people of color. It allows people of color who live, work, and go to school in Vermont to participate and to get to know each other and to share our experiences and be in and and be in community together because we're like, oh my God, that happened to me. That happened to me. I thought I was the only one. And it's it's just a really great way to connect with people throughout the state. The other program we have is Families United. Families United is a peer support group for people and families who have been impacted by the child welfare system, DCF, Department of Children and Families, and want to create two systemic and institutionalized changes. Members share experience, build relationships, discuss resources, and organize to influence change in the child welfare system and family or law or other legislative systems. Most of the people that I've worked with actually have had some type of disability and have been discriminated against because of their disability or different ability or how they think or culturally how they show up. And it has been a serious, serious issue for families who have interfaced with the DCF system. And so being able to have them understand that they're not alone in their experiences is very key for us. That just because they might have a different ability or a disability that might not allow them to maybe fully care for their children in the way that some societies feel is necessary, that does not mean they're not good parents, and it does not mean that they shouldn't be a part of their children's lives. And we're strong advocates for making sure that um, whenever possible, children can stay with their families. Another program, Healing and Practice, and this is another multiracial space. And um, it is a multiracial collaborative of healing centered space for our BIPOC community, their families and our white racial accountability partners, which are primarily through our Lost River Racial Justice and their families. And together we create um, multiracial spaces for connection, healing, learning and building community in different ways where I can just show up. So we go on hikes. We've done meditation, we've done river days, we've done game nights, we've done educational workshops, we've done retreats and all sorts of things. So it's based on what do we want to do to connect at across races or with multiracial families? How do we want to be connecting with each other and supporting each other? And then the last um, program that I'll talk about is um, BIPOC Thriving Network. The BIPOC Thriving, Thriving Network, I think, is like the core, one of the cores of the root. And um, what that stands for is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Thriving Network. Um, we come together to sustain our communities, heal from racial trauma, and organize collectively to build relationships, power, and systemic change for the lives of people of color. But really what that breaks down to is, is healing. It's all about healing. We decided that healing needs to be one of the center things that we do. So when we talk about we center blackness, when we talk about the intersectionality of youth, queer, trans, and differently able people, one of our other main things we do is surrounded around healing. In response to ongoing impacts of systemic racism and white supremacy culture, that we continue to center blackness. And through that, we created a mutual aid supportive network, which allows BIPOC folks in Vermont to access financial funds for their needs and connect to a network of folks able and willing to support them and their needs in their lives. So what this looks like is we currently, if you live in Vermont and are a BIPOC person, you can go to our website and apply for up to $500 for whatever that need that you have in your life. Um, in addition to that, let's say, hey, I need $1,000, but we're only offering 500. If you want us to kick it out to our network of people who might have other financial resources to donate to you personally to help meet that gap, we can do that as well. In addition to that, the networking part is what's really key, is that we're not just giving out money and being like, bye. 
We're hoping that you connect with us and want to show up to our programming, that you want to volunteer, that you want to engage with us. So the networking part is also like, well, I have this financial need, but you know what I really need is I don't have a car and I need a ride to the doctors next week. You know, I really need, I have this interview for a job and I really need some childcare. You know, um, I have section eight that's about to pound on my door to do this inspection. I need somebody to help clean my house. That is the networking part where we have a group of people who are established for specifically working with BIPOC people who have an analysis that will not harm us. We well, at least we're pretty sure they won't um, to where you can access them as a resource for your everyday thriving and everyday needs as well. So and then you're making connections, you're making relationships with those people. We're making relationships across race and really building community through that. Thanks, David. And so now I am pleased to introduce Luke Rackers from Central Vermont Council on Aging. I'm gonna put a little less uh, um, Zoom spotlight on you. Hold on a second. Where are you? Spotlight, there you go. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. And I appreciate these opportunities happening over Zoom because I am um, overcoming one of those fun winter colds. So I apologize if I need to take a few second break to uh, take a drink or, or cough. That's what's happening if you see me go off camera. Um, so I appreciate these Zoom happenings. Um, I'm going to share my screen just to help me keep uh, in line today with, with what I have to share with you. So again, my name is Luke Rackers. I use he, they pronouns, and I am the Director of Community Engagement at the Central Vermont Council on Aging. Um, just a, a little bit about uh, me. Um, I have a background in the music and the arts. I was a pianist, composer, music educator, and um, a teacher as my first career. Uh, but I moved to Vermont in 2016 and was um, uh, came to CVCOA as an AmeriCorps member doing direct service in the community as my AmeriCorps position. Now, I've held multiple positions here, uh, mostly in the volunteer department, but I also started a new position. We were one of the first in Vermont to offer this position. I'm a community-engaged tech specialist position to help older adults um, bridge the digital divide and provide devices and internet options counseling and training um, for older adults to help them stay connected. Um, I was the director of development and communication for a few years and now leading all of our volunteer uh, programs and community engagement work. I'm also a graduate student in gerontology and have really strong interest in creative aging, LGBTQ plus issues and aging, um, end of life issues, social isolation and loneliness, which we'll talk a lot about today, and um, habits of mind as we age. A CVCOA is one of five area agencies on aging in Vermont, it, no matter where you are in Vermont or the country, um, you're in an area that has an area agency on aging or a council on aging, as they're sometimes known. Um, these organizations date back to the 1960s from the Older Americans Act and exist to support older adults and caregivers and their families in Vermont um, to help people age uh, with dignity and choice is, is our particular mission at CDCOA. But we provide programs and services to help people uh, maintain their independence and live in their homes and communities as long as possible as they age. Um, CVCOA offers lots of different programs and services uh, to help people um, accomplish that goal of living independently, staying in their homes and communities as they age. We have an in information assistance line that anyone can call, um, whether you're a family member, a caregiver, or older adult. Um, we offer internet options counseling, um, we have a family, family caregiver support program, um, case management and options counseling, and that's for things like uh, applying to um, our three squares food benefits in Vermont or fuel assistance, um, housing application assistance, um, and any resources and supports to help people maintain that independent living. Um, nutrition and wellness, uh, you've probably heard of Meals on Wheels. Um, all of those Meals on Wheels um, programs run through Central Vermont Council on Aging, and we have 13 partner sites and senior centers in our service area who de deliver those meals. Um, and we have exercise and wellness classes in the community. Uh, and these bottom two programs and uh, services are the ones my department really has uh, most um, attention to, and that's volunteer services and community engagement. 
and our social connection initiatives. So in our community engagement, um, we have direct service volunteer uh, opportunities, and these are opportunities for volunteers of any age to support older adults and caregivers in the community. And this could be rights to doctor's appointments and grocery shopping, uh, helping with organizing papers, uh, transportation to medical appointments, um, and just providing companionship. Really everything we do in the direct service world comes down to providing companionship. Um, we also have a couple of AmeriCorps senior programs, including our senior companion program and our RSVP program. And that program um, focuses on uh, recruiting volunteers for companionship, uh, delivering meals on wheels, exercise classes in the community, um, and a lot more. Um, we have uh, a few new uh, volunteer activities that uh, we're working on developing, including um, our technology navigators or companions, um, volunteers who are paired one-on-one -on -one with people in the community um, to help provide support and training, um, to uh, help learn how to do things like use Zoom so they can connect with uh, friends and family members. Um, and my department also talks a lot about ageism awareness. We have some community events. Um, I do a lot of creative aging advocacy I, and I work on community partnerships like our work with All Brains of Belongs Vermont. And we'll, we'll have some community um, partnership grants uh, coming out again this year. So one of the things I'd like to focus on today related to um, social isolation and loneliness and um, connecting people as a path to help. Um, as Mel mentioned earlier in her slides. Um, I started a program in the pandemic called Enhancing Social Connection Through Arts and Technology. Um, there's several components of this, and one is providing a creative care kit that's packed with supplies and materials that lasts many months of practice for people and includes a binder of activities that's, uh, that are developed by a professional teaching artist in Vermont. Um, and people have the op opportunity to be connected with a creative companion a volunteer who will contact program participants a few times a month just to help um, inspire and motivate their work and tell stories um, that arise through artwork because we know that those meaningful stories and connections really arise through that creative process and we want to foster that and encourage that. Um, we also offer video tutorials and additional resources that we find to participants um, live Zoom sessions with the teaching artists. Um, we will provide iPads and individualized tech support, um, again, to help people with that connection. Um, internet options counseling to make sure people they ha have the access they need to participate in things like Zoom calls. And then additional training through other uh, partners we have in the community, like Technology for Tomorrow. Um, we, we offer live classes through Senior uh, Planet and uh, Get Set Up, which is a platform that um, all older Vermonters have um, access to for free uh, right now, which has hundreds of classes um, online. So one of our goals is to help older adults overcome the barriers and blocks to creativity and connection. And that's why there are so many components to this program, because we are trying to um, provide a customized experience that help people overcome um, any blocks or barriers they maybe have on their creative journey. Um, and finding ways to support the creative journeys of older adults, especially uh, people who are engaging in creative practices for the first time or needing to engage in creative practices in their homes. We know there are a ton of wonderful arts opportunities um, in our local communities. Uh, we're trying to help alleviate this opportunity barrier for people in their homes. Um, to me, it's a barrier that often gets overlooked um, when we're thinking about access, especially for older adults and how we can bridge the divide uh, with our programs to make sure we're still connecting people when they need to participate from their homes. Um, create, creative aging for me is such an integral part of healthy aging and connection. Um, I love this quote by Maya Angelou. Um, you can't, uh, and apologies for the typo in Maya Angelou's name there, uh, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. I love that quote and just a few photos um, from our Creative Aging Celebration, which we host every year um, to highlight the uh, work from our program participants. Um, we know that creativity can impact our social, emotional, physical, uh, mental health in so many different ways. It's why it's such a passion of mine. And creativity really helps with that uh, connection. Um, activities connect people by helping us do with rather than do for. And the stories that arise through art making provide unique opportunities for meaningful connection and sharing. 
these photos here of uh, our participants' artwork are two great examples. Um, every time I see people's artwork from the program, I ask them, well, why, how did this come about? Tell me, tell me the story. Um, how, how did you develop this piece? The one on the left here is a participant who lives in Vermont. And I learned that she at one point lived in New York City and lived through a major hurricane in New York City. And this is her remembrance of uh, her, uh, that hurricane and umbrellas blowing all over the city uh, during that time, I think back in the 1980s. And another one on the right here, this is a program participant who got really into painting and drawing and has been sending uh, greeting cards um, to her family members, friends, um, since starting our program about three years ago. And we recently just received an email from her daughter thanking us because they continue to get these cards and they learn things about uh, their mother and grandmother because of what she's painting on the front of these cards. So it's such, such a great um, way to build that connection um, intergenerationally too. Uh, this photo just so shows one way we connect people both via creativity and that technology. Um, some of our volunteers will connect with folks on Zoom, and this is one example of our volunteer on the screen and our program participant um, getting ready to show their painting uh, to our volunteer on the screen. I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip uh, skip skip a lot of my slides here. But that is to say, you know, my focus um, recently has been on building these um, creative uh, volunteer activities that are all centered on companionship. But we have a ton of volunteer opportunities at CDCOA um, for all ages. And so I certainly encourage you to um, check our website. Um, that's a great place that you go can go to um, review the different opportunities. And there's a form on our website to express your interest in volunteering as well. Because uh, we know volunteering is not only good for those who are serving, but also good for you, right? Think about all the ways it enhances your life as well. Um, we also uh, like to talk a lot about ageism awareness at CDCOA, and hopefully this will be more conversations we can have uh, with you, Mel, going forward in the intersection between um, ageism and ableism. We know it's so, they're both so pervasive in our society. Um, in so many different ways. And we see it in our faces these days with an election coming up and seeing that we have uh, candidates who are apparently too old um, to serve in public office. Uh, but we see it in our personal lives and our structures and institutions and how we interact with each other. And hopefully we can all continue to have these conversations about ageism and ableism and how they impact all of us. And I think I'll leave it there, Mel. Thank you so much, Luke. And it sounds like that um, that should be a future brain club topic. Good luck. Yes. All right, let me remove spotlight and introduce our fourth panelist. I am very pleased to introduce Chris Hansen, Executive Director of Intentional Peer Support. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, I am, my name is uh, Chris Hansen. I use she, her pronouns. I live here in Burlington, Vermont, uh, and I'm originally from New Zealand. Uh, nice to see you here, Tanya, um, from Queensland. Uh, I'm actually headed off there in, in a few weeks. Um, and Aussies feel like neighbours uh, on this side of the world. So um, I, Mel said, don't do a PowerPoint, don't prepare. Uh, here's some questions. So I am winging it. And uh, that's good for me because I'm used to getting kind of tied to a, a PowerPoint. Uh, I'm also uh, a person who's neurodiverse. And um, and I also live with uh, Tourette's and, and, and a stutter, which may or may not turn up. Uh, we call it Fred when it does. It just arrived in my life when I was 61 after a full knee replacement. Uh, which apparently makes me a unicorn. It's not very pop, uh, very, very uh, common. Anyway, uh, intentional peer support is really what I'm here to talk about. So uh, intentional peer support uh, was started by Sherry Mead and uh, she uh, was living in New Hampshire at the time and going in and out of psychiatric hospitals. 
uh, at the same time as she was doing some graduate studies and uh, doing a lot of, of writing and, and research. And she realized that none of the uh, mental health services in the community did anything for her. And she said that, actually one day she said it to her psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, well, why don't you set something up? And so she did. Uh, she ended up with a grant for a, a, a small community center and they decided to set up what then became the world's first what uh, peer-run respite. Uh, and a peer-run respite is a community based alternative to psychiatric hospital. So, um, uh, and it's run and staffed by people who have used mental health services themselves. And there are now a couple of hundred of them around the world or between one, one and 200 of them around the world. So this is really, really grown. And what Sherry discovered was that uh, uh, a couple of things. She was going in and out um, of the hospital and went uh, and was also in school and uh, realized that five minutes after she was in the hospital, uh, she became what she calls a mental patient uh, and, and learned to see herself that way. And she also did some internship at a domestic violence center and discovered that people would come in, they'd be called brave and courageous and uh, go to the doctor and come out shaking a bottle of pills saying, I've got a severe and persistent mental illness and I'll be taking these pills for the rest of my life. And she realized that there was something wrong with that. So, so her mission really became to find ways to connect, uh, to learn to, to connect, realizing that uh, many of us, when we are... Uh, uh, when, when we're in receipt of mental health services, learn to be on the receiving end and um, and all of the relationships that we have are here uh, to help us and we lose any sense of reciprocity in relationships. Um, and that certainly has been part of my background. I've, I have uh, a number of other uh, psychiatric diagnoses have I, I've acquired over the years and um, I've also had experience of getting uh, locked up in in the mental health service so and uh, losing a lot and uh, deciding that the people who did the most for my sense of well-being were not the people who were paid to be there they were my fellow inpatients who I sat with me or I sat with them or we sat with each other in the smoking room because that's where the best conversations were so I took up smoking um and uh and and that stayed with me I came out of 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 that uh thinking these are my people and this is what I want to do so I uh, reincarnated myself as a bit of an activist from hell uh, in the mental health services and started doing human rights work and then started looking at what are some of the alternatives that work and intentional peer support was one of them. So intentional peer support is uh, an organization that provides training, uh, provides peer support training and what we, what we, our, our intent and our vision is to support one another to think about how to be mindfully present in relationships with one another and to think about how do we actually connect with one another in meaningful ways some people find that really easy they can do it standing on their heads with their eyes shut and some of us actually have to really think about it and work work at it and I, sherry was one of those people and the gift that that gave her was realizing that it would be really helpful to be able to break relationships down and to to see them um uh, as 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 a way of being uh but to think about them in certain ways and um and go to uh uh refer back to queensland again uh tanya uh, because this was actually on my list of things to to quote but there is a quote for, that came out of queensland australia uh, from a group of Aboriginal activists, which says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But you, if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us walk together. 
And it's one of my favorite quotes, and it really encapsulates the spirit of intentional peer support. Um, IPS, uh, which is the acronym we use for it, uh, is about uh, three principles uh, and four tasks. The three principles are a bit like uh, the polish on a dance floor. Uh, it's about shifting focus. Uh, the first shift is uh, from helping one another, I've got it all together and I'm here to help you, uh, to learning and growing together and acknowledging that you may have as much if not more to be able to offer or contribute to me and my learning as I have to you. Uh, and, and that's a huge shift uh, for, for, for many of us, particularly those of us who've been trained in human services. The second shift in focus is shifting the focus from the individual, from you uh, or from me, to the relationship. How, what can we do to make this relationship work? Is this working? What does it need? How can we be present together to one another? And then the third shift in focus is shifting the focus from, and sometimes through fear, to hope and possibility. And if you think about in traditional mental health uh, services, uh, there's a lot of focus on what you don't want, uh, you know, uh, what we've got to stop doing, what uh, people are afraid that we're going to do. And some of us actually lose sight of what our passion, our aspirations, our desires are. Uh, so there's four tasks um, and I'm going to try and rocket through these really quickly and then tell you a little bit more about intentional peer support. Um, so the four tasks, and the tasks are a bit like the steps, the dance steps. Uh, the first task is connection. And uh, connection is something that is kind of intangible and we don't think about a lot often, but we know when we're connected and we know when we're not connected. And I like to think about connection as seeing and being seen. And uh, we talk a little, and we talk a bit about, you know, how do we connect? How do we disconnect? We all know what that's like. Some of us do it many times in a day, sometimes many times in an hour. Um, but more than that, how do we reconnect? And what does that take? And is that possible? And that's a real challenge for, for most of us to sort of leave this little trail behind us of, of broken relationships and, and frequently don't even consider that relationship might be possible. Uh, second, we talk about worldview. And there's uh, two or more than two worldviews in many relationships. That's the lens that we see the world through uh, that's come from all of our life's experiences and uh, ups and downs. Uh, and, you know, that's our uh, experiences of trauma and privilege and oppression and uh, travel and um, uh, uh, success and and what's been seen as failure and, and, and all of the aspects that make, make us. Um, and it's been about acknowledging my own worldview and being curious about yours um, and finding a way to hold both of those at the same time in the in, in a in a conversation or a relationship and that's what we call so the third task second task first is connection second is worldview the third one is mutuality and mutuality is you and me both present in the conversation me having the courage to share my vulnerability and my story with you um, sometimes me having the courage to ask you for what I need, uh, to tell you uh, that you're scaring me or that I don't understand you or, or that's a hot button for me. Um, and, uh, and then the fourth task is moving towards as opposed to moving away from. And it's really often what happens as a result of uh, mutuality is that possibilities open up. But it's so different from... Traditionally, many of the foci in our relationships, which are what we don't want, what we are mad about, problems, um, what's going wrong, and uh, thinking about what is possible and 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 you know where might we go from here. And it, I I think of it as a bit like a martial art, 
it's it's an ongoing living practice and uh for me most of the time uh, the uh, the practice is reflecting on what I haven't you know what didn't go well and thinking about what I might do differently um so it's it's just you know like going to the dojo or going to a rehearsal for for, for dance so IPS uh intentional peer support is an organization and Mel how long is this uh brain club for what time do you shut so it usually it'll wrap up in the next couple of minutes, but say what I, I am I am captivated by everything coming out of your mouth. So for anyone who needs to go at seven, which in, is in three minutes, we completely understand and respect you departing at seven. But All Chris, right. your I am determined to be succinct. So we provide trainings. Uh the uh at, and uh there's a 40 hour uh core training uh which you can do on Zoom. Uh it's 10 four-hour sessions on Zoom, or you can do it uh, in person. And if you're interested in that, you can contact me at info, I-N-F-O, at intentionalpeersupport.org. And if you're living in Vermont, you can get those, um, you can get that training for uh, a, for a, a very small fee. It, it may be $100 for a book. If you've got financial hardship, you contact us um, and we'll um, sort you out elsewhere. Um, other places it can be up to nine, $900 each um, for what we call a pay per seat training and we will provide trainings to organizations um, and uh, as well. Uh, we You can train as a trainer um, and uh, we've got a bunch of other trainings and practices called co-reflection which is uh, sort of reflecting on our practice together. Uh, so Mel's put the uh, contact details there uh, in the um, in the chat, and um, and yeah, I, and and uh, we are a small uh, organization. Uh, we we run ourselves as a social enterprise, um, and we're working at uh, building ourselves into a co cooperative. Um, and uh, I'm a co-director, and. Um, uh, and uh, we're working at uh, have, having a cooperative of um, many, uh, a, num a number of, of directors uh, moving into the future. And I'm going to wrap it up there because uh, I'm just squeaking in under the seven o'clock mark. That was pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we probably have time for, um, I'm hold on, hold on, but I, I did not mean to take away your spotlight, put it back. I wanted to add a spotlight. There we go. Add a spotlight. Um, we probably have time for like one question. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Your regular hand is fine. Oh, also, can I say one more thing? Yes. Yeah, and I also wanted to shout out uh, to Sarah Knutson, who uh, is part of the All Brains Belong com community, who's just done endless work with us, for us, supporting us. So um, yeah, I just wanted to to acknowledge that. And Sarah can also answer questions if you happen to know. If, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I think you they, them pronoun, Sarah. Um, so uh, thank <laughs> And in fact, Sarah is our presenter. They will be presenting on the um, the therapeutic aspects of social connection next week. I, that, maybe that was not really a summary of, of what you'll be talking about. But anyway, um, I'm very excited for, for your presentation next week, Sarah. Um, Thank you. So Well, I've just been so inspired listening to both of you and to all four of our panelists today, just like the incredible work that you're doing. And it's, 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 you know, I think so much of this is about learning all of the like incredible things going on in this community and bringing everyone together and breaking down silos and, you know, all of the magical things that come from that. So it's, 
Thank you both so much. And I, yeah, so Sierra's adding to that. It's great hearing the framework of mutual aid and community-based support from so many different communities. Yeah, great. You've seen themes, right? Like we've heard several different versions of, of a lot of universality of what it means to bring to, you know, bring people together and, you know, um, have, uh, relationships being the core of, of everything. So thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week um, for, for, for Sarah's uh, presentation on uh, social connection as medicine. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Oh, cool. You. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Luke. <laughs>